Number 1 April 6, 1986 Nine-year-old Anthonette Gaedito and her two younger sisters were at their home in Gallup, New Mexico. Their mother was at a bar with her friends, and the three children were being looked after by a babysitter. In the early hours, their mother returned and sent the babysitter home. She then fell into a deep, alcohol-induced sleep. At 3 a.m., there was a knock at the front door. Both Anthonette and one of her sisters were still awake. Anthonette asked who was there. Uncle Joe, said a voice on the other side of the door. Hurry up, let us in, we're cold. Anthonette opened the door. According to her sister, she was immediately grabbed by two men who pulled her into a brown van outside. She kicked and screamed, but could do nothing to stop her abductors. They drove off with her into the night, and for the past 33 years, Anthonette Gaedito has remained a missing person. Her real Uncle Joe was determined not to be involved in any way. One year after her kidnap, the Gallup police station received this chilling call. Unfortunately, the call was too short to be traced. When Anthonette's mother listened to the recording, she said that she was sure it was her daughter's voice. It seemed like Anthonette was still alive, though perhaps living a fate worse than death. Her mother didn't recognize the voice of the man who cut the call short. His identity remains unknown. Anthonette's mother died in 1999 without ever discovering what happened to her daughter. And the same goes for her father who died in 2012. Back in 1991, there was one reported sighting of Anthonette, though the validity of that sighting has never been confirmed. A waitress in Carson City, Nevada, noticed a teenage girl that matched Anthonette's description. She was with a quote-unquote unkempt couple, and continually knocked her utensils onto the floor. Every time the waitress went to pick up her knife and fork for her, the girl grabbed her hand and squeezed it tightly. After the girl left with the couple, the waitress found a napkin hidden under her plate. On it, the teenager had written two messages. Help me. Call police. There have been no further sightings of anyone matching Anthonette's description. If you think it's strange that a young girl would answer the door at three in the morning, then you're not alone. It came to light that numerous people were coming in and out of the Caedita household on the very night that Anthonette was taken. Anthonette's mother neglected to mention that to the police. It makes you wonder who was there and why the mother didn't tell them. It appears that the mother may have had more information about her daughter's disappearance than she let on. She even failed the police lie detector test. It's also telling that the cops paid Anthonette's mother one last visit on her deathbed. Were they perhaps hoping that she might confess something, or reveal some information before she passed away? One other important thing to note is that the Caedito household had a screen door. This suggests that Anthonette may have recognized her abductors. If she didn't, why would she have unlatched the screen? Regardless, Investigators believe that Anthonette is no longer alive. They have, however, released this image, showing what she might have looked like in 2013. 
Interestingly, 10 months ago, a Reddit user by the name of Sleuthing Noob came across a Jane Doe file, a police report about an unknown murder victim. The report said that in 1996, a body had been discovered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Take a look at this description and these reconstruction images. They're eerily similar to Anthonet's 2013 reconstruction. The user contacted the Albuquerque Police Department, but according to NAMAS, the US Resource Center for Missing and Unidentified People, it's been determined that this Jane Doe is not in fact Anthonet. Still, it just goes to show that even after 33 years, people are still actively trying to solve this mystery. Perhaps one day, we'll know the truth about what happened to Anthonette. Number 2 Being a police dispatcher can be a tough job emotionally, something that many new operators find out during their training. Learning how to handle distress calls involves listening to a bunch of them, and some, like the one you're about to hear, are harder to sit through than others. This call was made by a woman named Ruth Price and has been used in the training of new dispatchers since the 1980s. Many dispatchers say this is the most disturbing call they've ever heard. What's the problem, ma'am? Oh, well, there's some guy been uh, taking the place out. No. Well, he went in the back. I have an apartment in the back, and he said he was looking for a guy. And he comes to my door. And yes. And uh, said he's uh, looking for an apartment. So I'm real, I live alone, and I'm an old lady. Mm -hmm. where, where is he now, ma'am? I don't have no idea. <laughs> Despite being so prolifically used in dispatcher training, very little information exists about the call. The call is always presented to trainees as 100% authentic. Recruits are always told the backstory to the case, and they're always told that Ruth did not survive the attack. Despite this, pretty much no information about Ruth's case exists online. It supposedly happened before the days of the internet, but you'd think that there'd at least be something out there about it. As one former dispatcher writes, In the early 1990s, I worked as a 911 dispatcher in Florida. This call was played for us as part of a training exercise, as an example of why it's so critical to ask for a caller's address before asking anything else. As a result of similar incidents, it's been policy across various police departments to state, 911, what's your location? What little information there is matches up with what I was told in the early 90s. The call was made in 1988. The caller was an elderly woman named Ruth Price. She was killed by a prowler and the prowler was not apprehended. I'm so frustrated by the lack of any credible information about this call. Because of the lack of information about the case, it remains a mystery whether this call is genuine or just an amazing piece of voice acting. Another former dispatcher is more certain that the call is real. Although there were rumors that this was fake when it first came out, sadly, the recording is 100% real. The recording is used in police training on what not to do during a 911 call, and why you should always get the location or address first. Because of a 911 operator not getting that info and not really taking her seriously, the cops never got out there in time, and the killer was never caught. There's little info out there on Google as this happened way back in the 80s, before the internet or Google existed, but there was a thread posted about it on a police forum back in 2002. I'll try to find it and link it, but from what I remember, I'm pretty sure she was beaten or bludgeoned 
to death. If you scour some online forums, you'll still find people debating whether this calls are real or fake. Whatever the case though, the prospect of receiving a call like this is enough to put anyone off becoming a police dispatcher. That much, I'm sure of. Number 3 July 1974 A man named Bashir Kaujakchi went to pick up his wife from a party in Beirut. His wife was a singer. The venue that she was singing at was known to be a gathering spot for Middle East diplomats and arms dealers. While en route to pick her up, a white van drove Bashir off the road. Several armed men came out and forced Bashir into the van with them. He had just been abducted, and he had no idea why. The men took him to a basement in an unknown location. For the next five days, Bashir was tortured by his new captors. When he told them that he was an American citizen, they accused him of being a spy for the CIA. Still utterly confused, Bashir told them that they'd simply got the wrong guy that he had no idea who they were or what they wanted from him. Still, the torture continued. He wasn't allowed to sleep and was only fed small meals. He would also hear the tortured screams of other prisoners being held at the same location. Rather than endure his torment any longer, Bashir attempted to kill himself. Using a small piece of plastic, he cut his wrists. Surprisingly, the men holding him hostage actually took him to the hospital and saved his life. After receiving medical treatment, Bashir was able to escape. That was the first bizarre incident in the life of Bashir, a victim of mistaken identity. Cut to 1983, and Bashir had become a successful restaurateur in the USA. His crown jewel was the Marrakesh a Moroccan-themed restaurant in Philadelphia which his sister managed. While working on the construction of a second Marrakesh restaurant in Washington DC, Bashir started to receive some peculiar phone calls. The newly installed landline would ring, and Bashir would answer, but there would only be eerie breathing on the other end of the line. When Bashir installed an answering machine, things began to escalate. Someone would leave messages where they'd just laugh into the receiver while strange noises played in the background. Whoever was doing this had the voice of a child, making the constant harassment all the more strange. As time went by, the harassment got more extreme. The caller started threatening Bashir's life and the life of his employees. Machine gun fire and screams could be heard in the background of the calls now. Bashir thought the scream sounded familiar. They were just like the ones he had heard from other prisoners when he was a hostage in Beirut. These were more than mere prank phone calls now. Because of the caller's childlike voice, he was given the nickname L'Enfant, French for the child. For the next decade, Bashir's restaurant would receive an average of 15 to 20 calls a day from L'Enfant. If he travelled to the Philadelphia branch of the Marrakesh, L'Enfant would just call there instead. The mystery caller always seemed to know where Bashir was at any given time. Eventually, things became more serious than simple phone harassment. Bashir's unknown tormentor began tampering with his vehicle, carving stars of David into the paintwork. They even began cutting the wires in his car, which, at one point, led to the vehicle catching fire. Now fearing that his life was actually in danger, Bashir went to the FBI for help. They placed a wiretap on the phone at his restaurant. Over the course of 18 months, over 3,000 sinister calls were recorded. These calls all came from payphones. The strange part though, 
was that oftentimes, the calls were made in completely different parts of the DC metro area, but were made within seconds of each other. That strongly suggested that there were multiple people involved in the harassment, and that they were highly organized. Bashir was eventually forced to check himself into a mental hospital. The calls were beginning to take their toll on him, and he needed to escape. Still, Lomfong continued to call him at the hospital. While Bashir was away, Richard, the young son of the Marrakesh's new manager, was attacked by two unknown men. Lomfont later called to let the manager know that they were responsible. They even spray-painted the words, Richard will die, on their front door. In 1993, the story of Lomfont was featured on the popular show Unsolved Mysteries. After the episode aired, the calls from Lomfont suddenly stopped. Perhaps the person or the group feared being identified. Whatever the case, they had made Bashir's life a living hell for ten straight years. To this day, the identities of the Lomfont callers remain unknown. Who were they, and just how many of them were there? Why had they dedicated ten years to tormenting Bashir? Were the calls linked to his abduction and torture in 1974? And finally, was Bashir simply the victim of mistaken identity in that incident as he had claimed? All questions that remain unanswered. In 2002, it came to light that Bashir was running a website that revolved around homophobia and anti-Semitism. He even published an advertisement for his restaurant containing the line, Have Zionists turned Jewish beliefs into a political party in the service of hatred and greed? That line doesn't exactly scream fine dining to me. People have debated whether Bashir had always held these extreme beliefs, if they were somehow the reason he was targeted by L'Enfant, or whether these views were the result of his mental breakdown brought about by the calls. If you'd like to dive deeper into this mystery, I've left a link to an interesting podcast in the description below. Be sure to check it out after the video. Number four. What, uh, what should I do? or bad. They hung up. Gary Subbrink, a soldier stationed down in Texas, took some time off from his base to visit his family in New York. He didn't tell anyone that he was heading home since he wanted to surprise them all. While waiting for his flight at the airport, he was approached by a man holding a clipboard. The man began asking him a bunch of questions, like how he spelled his name, where he was going, and other personal information. Gary figured the man was trying to sell him something, so he tried not to pay him any attention. Problem was, the guy was persistent. When Gary boarded the plane to New York, he forgot all about the encounter. Then, just as he was relaxing into his seat, a different man holding a clipboard sat down in the seat next to him. Again, this new guy started questioning him. Gary told him to get lost, but this guy too was persistent. When a stewardess came to check the clipboard man's ticket, she told him, This isn't your seat, you need to move. Luckily, the guy with the clipboard obliged. Two strange encounters for sure, but nothing to worry about. When he finally arrived in New York, Gary went to surprise one of his close friends with a visit. He became confused when his friend didn't appear surprised to see him at all. When Gary asked why that was, the friend replied, What are you talking about? You told me you were coming to New York yesterday. That was strange, Gary thought. He definitely hadn't told his friend he was coming. Gary worked out that someone must have called his friend using his phone number somehow, pretended to be him, 
and then told his friend about his plan to return home. A weird prank to say the least. Not to mention, Gary didn't recall telling any of his buddies back at the base that he was returning home. Next, Gary went to surprise his parents. It's while he was at their home that he started receiving these strange calls from an unlisted number. Whoever was calling him spoke with a sinister, robotic voice, like they were using a voice changer or something. The robot would ask Gary the same question multiple times, like, how long are you back from Texas? And made weird statements like, you are being impersonated by the other voice. These calls would come day and night. Gary tried talking to the unknown caller. Gary's father tried talking to the unknown caller, but they could never get any information out of it. The calls were so relentless that Gary started recording them. Yes, this is me. Can I speak to you? Can I ask why you're... Yes, can I ask why you're calling? Can I please ask... Yes, this is... Yes, that is me. Say that again? Leave? I'm staying right here. Is this a joke or what? a second. Yeah, what is your question? I'll answer it. So how long are you going to be back from Texas? How long? You are being impersonated by the other voice. Right. When am I coming back? Is that your question? Okay, there was a break. Hold on. You want to know when I'm coming back to Texas? Oh, is that your question? So how long are you going to be back from Texas? How long am I going to be back from Texas? That question doesn't make any sense. Okay. I'll be coming back eventually. Um, I can't tell you when. You should know that question, the answer to the question, because you seem to know more about me than I do. As many have noted, it sounds like the caller's voice is coming from a tape recorder. Every time he repeats something, it's said in the exact same way. And, as Wish I Knew Who points out, you can even hear the whir of the machine as the caller rewinds and fast-forwards the tape. The calls go on for a lot longer than the clips I've played here, with the strange voice continually repeating vague and nonsensical questions. To this day, Gary has no idea who continuously called him while he was in New York, nor does he know what they wanted from him and why they disguised their identity. He also doesn't know who the men with the clipboard were, or how someone was able to inform his friend of his return. What do you think's going on in this one? Your guess is as good as mine. Number 5 I suppose this last one's cheating a little, since it's technically a phone message rather than a phone call, but it's interesting and creepy nonetheless. Four years ago, a Reddit user posted a chilling story that happened to their mother. Worried that the call might be linked to the Nuclear Defense Agency, the user created the post anonymously under a new account. In 2012, the user received a call from their elderly mother. She was calling from her neighbor's house, and she was absolutely hysterical, sobbing about how somebody had taken over her home phone. 
the user was confused by what she meant. But then again, she was very old. The neighbor she was with checked out the phone, and everything seemed normal. So eventually, she calmed down and returned to her house. A few days passed, and then the same thing happened again. The user's mother called them in a state of pure terror. Once again, she was at her neighbor's house, shaking uncontrollably. This time, she refused to go back to her home. The Reddit user took a week off work to stay with their mother. To begin with, the user couldn't find anything wrong with the phone, and figured that the mother was just going a little senile. That proved not to be the case. Over the next few days, the user discovered what was really going on. Every day, between 7 and 7.15 p.m., a strange message took over their mother's phone. When she lifted the receiver, instead of a dial tone, she'd hear this unsettling message. Outside of that 15-minute window, the phone would work normally. The phone didn't ring at 7 p.m. or anything. It was just that if you lifted it to make a call within those 15 minutes, you'd hear the creepy message rather than the dial tone. If you hung up the receiver and lifted it again, the message would restart. If you hung it up and lifted extremely quickly, the line would appear to be dead until 7.15. The user was able to make a recording of the message. Here's what it sounded like. Connecting you. Please hold the line. NORAD, AWS, Station Zulu Foxtrot 77. Zulu Foxtrot 77. Status alert CON 4. Status alert CON 4. Security tracing in progress. Attention. 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 Whiskey. Whiskey. Zero. Nine. Ready. November. Papa. Four. Four. Danger. Hotel. Papa. Eight. Seven. Ready. Hotel. Quebec. Three. Nine. Ready. Papa. Kilo. Five. Eight. Ready. Foxtrot, Charlie, two, three, ready. November, November, one, eight, trigger. Victor, Yankee, nine, two, ready. Lima, Charlie, five, six, secure. Attention, attention, attention. For the whole day after they recorded this message, their phone line was dead. The phone company said that they couldn't find a fault in the line. That evening, they attempted to record the message again to see if anything had changed, but rather than be met with the strange message, there was just the normal dial tone again. The message never came back. To this day, the origin of the call remains a mystery, but if you have any theories about this case, or any of the others in this video, be sure to leave them in the comment section below. Perhaps we can come up with some answers. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. A huge shout out to Let's Read and Lady White Rabbit for guest narrating in this video. 
Be sure to check out their channels by following the link down in the description below. Also, a huge shout out to my biggest supporters on Patreon. Stephanie, Crazy Mask Parade, Sebastian, James Labour, John Crouch, Lester Lido, Procupidine Natter, Bob the Davil, Gina Valera, Philip Westra, Alex Greensall, Monica Mendoza, Sion of the Emperor, Crawford K. MacDonald, Marley Wright, and Ray Price Burton. Thank you guys. If you'd like to consider becoming a patron yourself, then you can check out my Patreon page, which is also down in the description below. Be sure to smash that like button, or I'll smash you, and I'll be back with another video very, very soon. Until then guys, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.